What's up everybody, this is Carson from 3D Joe's and today we're at my friend Nomad's house. So, be prepared to be blown away by this crazy collection. All right man, so what are we looking at here? So we're looking at the Joe side of my G.I. Joe Cobra collection. So it's all split up into specialties and then it's mixed vintage, modern, pre-production, everybody and everything is thrown together. That's the G.I. Joe sort of command element up there. Then you've got Action Force. I've got the October Guard. Uh, you've got like the G.I. Joe, what I have made my own little like quick reaction team. Uh, Slaughter's Renegades and Marauders, G.I. Joe Mountain Troops. Down here is all the G.I. Joe Ninjas. Recon Team and Jungle Troops. The Arctic Troops. Below that you've got uh, Tiger Force. And then down at the bottom, you've got Battle Force 2000 slash kind of the uh, applied technology research. What I look at is like the Joe equivalent to DARPA. So tell me about your decision uh, to group these by subgroup. Why do, you, why do you prefer that as the ideal way to display? Just the way it makes sense to me, man. Like when you have Tiger Force, I can't put Tiger Force on a bunch of different shelves. Yeah, I know there's vintage and there's foreign and you know whatnot, but to put it all together, to get to see it all as one sub team as it was meant to be, kind of is the most logical way my brain works it. Being a military guy too, you know, my approach then is when you've got things oriented towards a mission, that's the best way to put it together. So who are a couple of your uh, favorite figures, prize possessions from these couple shelves here? Oh man. I don't think it's surprising most people that know me that I'm a big wetsuit and torpedo fan. So obviously those, those are special. I've always been a Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow fan like most everyone I know. But when you get into prized possessions, a lot of that gets more into, I guess, the things that were harder to acquire. You know, so there, there we get into some of the, uh, the foreign stuff, all the foreign Tiger Force figures maybe. Uh, I've got a whole lot of Brazilian stuff in here and uh, lately added a bunch of uh, Ruby Plus figures as well. So I would definitely put those at the top of my list. Awesome, so let's grab a couple of them. Um, yeah, so we can like look at grunts. I've got the thick one, thick thumb over here. So that's that variation. Perfect. This is a standard US mail or a standard US figure and then a US mail away. Yep. And then behind that, I've got the Mexican grunt, the Brazilian grunt and the Argentinian grunt. Um, I'm a huge fan, weirdly, like I don't know anyone else that is. I'm a big Badger fan. So I've got a bunch of U.S. Badgers with a European Badger thrown in, a Brazilian Badger, and then uh, the other uh, Brazilian Badger variation for the uh, Forca Assalto. So what do you think it is about the Badger? What draws you to it? Is it the construction, the colors, the play features? You know, when I was a kid, it was a fun little vehicle. It was small. I could take it over to my friend's house to play with it. It fit a figure popped open, had a little, you know, weapons rack inside. The neon colors never really bothered me. When I was a kid, I lost a couple figures in the tall grass. So being able to find my toys when we were outside playing was always good. Cool, man. Anything else on these two shelves that people would find of particular interest? I'm still pretty happy. I've found three variations on the U.S. Cover Girl, which we're still trying to figure out the origins of. These have different belt colors. The Her little pocket calculator, whatever that's supposed to be on the side, is a different color. The boots are different colors. This one here has black rivets to it with a whole different color pants as well and uh, different grays all over the figure. So how do you manage to, uh, to keep track of this stuff so far? I know you've been documenting uh, variants for many, many years now. Once I get them, I try to obviously put a lot of it on uh, Joe Declassified. We take photos and try and write up the history. I also have some Excel stuff to back, my, back up my head, but most of it's mental. And if you're looking for something nice, there's a no camo jammer up there to peek at. Oh, no camo jammer. Yeah, both gaucho variations. Awesome. So over here, just continuing more of the Joe collection. Um, obviously, you've got all the air power and then a bunch of subgroups here. I've got the uh, essentially more of the Joe support staff up top there. My glider guys. Uh, I wouldn't quite call this a random shelf, but this is, you know, sort of things that have almost no place mm -hmm. um, except together. So a lot of the uh, anniversary figures um, as well as the adventure team stuff. You got the Eco Troops, the Mega Marines, and then uh, below that I have all my Joe, my Joe like emergency responders. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I get down into the generals and artillery, sort of the real heavy vehicles there. And then as you move over, I've got all the Desert Troops, Night Force, and then uh, it goes from there, it goes into Rotary Wing, the Star Brigade space stuff, uh, Sky Patrol, and then all my fixed wing aircraft. So are you partial to any one subgroup over another? 
you have a pretty wide spread across. <laughs> uh, you, you've, run the, you've run the gamut, right? You're not uh, picking one over the other. No, definitely not. Personally, is there one that resonates with you a little more? Uh, on the Joe side, not really. Cobra side, I like Python Patrol. Uh, Python Patrol was a great look and it had a good driving concept behind it. It did. I, to me, the, the Python Patrol was one of those subsets. Obviously, it was a re-release re of stuff we had already gotten before, but at least they had a storyline behind exactly. it. They had a rationale for it. If I had to pick one with Joe, honestly, Sky Patrol. As cool as Night Force was, the, uh, the chroming of the vehicles was pretty awesome to see as a kid. It was. The uh, Sky Raven was absolutely perfect to me. Exactly. All right, so do you have a, a good run on any particular character here? Any uh, rare international variants you could walk us through? Or? Well, right about where you're at now, it would be idiotic of me not to show out the canceled 9798 Desert Headquarters figures. Mm -hmm. Headquarters figures, so you have the Outback, uh, the Pathfinder, and then the Dial Tone. Awesome. Uh, those were definitely a special purchase. Now, were those going to be single carded or were they going to be a three pack? No, that or? was going to come with a, the in, initial intention was for a re-release of the original headquarters. Okay. That was going to come out. The and 1983 headquarters. Exactly. And then instead we ended Shit. later up getting the 92 headquarters re-released. Awesome. Anything else in this two shelf section? I kind of like as a Joe fan. Are these all Wild Bill? Yeah, it's a whole lot of Wild Bill. Yeah, let's run through Wild Bill. He's a favorite of mine. So you've got all the Wild Bills down here, obviously, modern, vintage, uh, fun school. you got a windmill thrown in there mm -hmm. for, for good measure. But if you come on up here, here's a U.S. Wild Bill. I'll move U.S. Wild Bill aside because that's not where the fun is. So we got different uh, tones of brown on the vest, obviously. Absolutely. Different browns and then uh, different blues mm -hmm. on the hats. Yeah, that right one's a little darker. My, my OCD-ish mind, I like to put them in order of browns. Light to dark? Light to dark. There you go. Yeah, I would do the same. I would do the same if I had all the variants that you did. Yeah, but I do not. I like to go for the more weird, almost obscure stuff. Some of the, my favorite pieces then end up being like the uh, yellow Norwegian radar rat. Um, it's already an absolutely absurd vehicle. It is. It really is. And when you put in the rarity and the fragility of a radar rat to begin with, finding the yellow one became a pretty hard pursuit for a while. Yeah, getting those antenna pegs without brakes on the bottom is. A huge pain. I notice you have the two different armor bots. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so do you collect all the variants for the for every vehicle that you have or do you just pick and choose which ones you're gonna make a run on? No. Um, for both figures and vehicles, if there's a variation that I find out about, you're going I'm going for it. I hear you. Did you collect straight through since you were a kid? I did not. Okay. How many years did you take off when did you get back into it? So I stopped in about 91. I think uh, Ninja Force, Storm, Shadow, and Slice were my last two figures that I got. Yep. And then uh, after that, I didn't pick up again until early 98, right after I had uh, joined the service. The real truth to this collection, too, is like as many photos as I've shared, you, I mean, you walked in the room today. You can't get a feel for the size of it until you're in it. No. You know? All right, so I love this display. I haven't seen those Cobra Fortresses on display before today. <laughs> no one else will probably admit owning those. All right, so what you've got here, pretty much a menagerie of Cobra troops. You've got the Venom troops, you've got the Coil, uh, the Dreadnoughts, the Headhunters, all of Destro's Iron Grenadiers, uh, the Crimson Guards, and then sort of like I did with the Joe side, uh, I split the Cobras into th sort of the thematic uh, mission-themed group. So desert troops, jungle troops, all the eco troops, mega marines, etc. Now I noticed for the one of the first times in this room, looking at it in detail, the it's only space. opening, the only opening. <laughs> in order to move things uh -huh. and, and put things in groups, I don't have a group that can go there, and okay. the shelf above it requires extra spacing for the uh, Toxo Lab, and so I don't have anything that can go there that doesn't thematically belong elsewhere. And so every variant that you have for every figure, you'll have it out on display, right? Absolutely. Talk, talk through your kind of methodology. If you collect something, you want to be able to show it. Yeah, so everything I own is on display one way, shape, or form. If that requires me adding a shelf, if that requires me buying a stand, uh, some of the aircraft have uh, flight post stands for them that I can pop them up. Whatever the case, I won't buy something that I don't have room to display. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe in having a part of a collection that's tucked away where no one can see it. 
Obviously, there's a limit to that, you know, two-dimensional things, file cards, cards, etc. There's no way to display all those at one time. But when it comes to the actual toys, I'm all about having it all where it can be seen. I've got a triple wide storage unit, 150 square feet, and it pains me at times to spend 180 bucks a month on that. The collection is not going up in value like that. It's just me holding on to something that I logically won't have the square footage anytime soon to display. So how do you break yourself of acquiring more than you have to display? What do you tell yourself? When I first got into collecting back in 98 and when I decided I was gonna troop build, I busted out a notebook and I looked at the available Joes at the time and I figured out how much I wanted of each troop builder, of each vehicle, of each whatever. And I've stuck to those numbers. Some of those were small numbers, some of those were large, but once I hit whatever number X it is, uh, that's where I go by. With me, a lot of guys know I do, do Cobra Troopers like in multiples of eight. And that depends on kind of what niche that troop fills. You know, if it's a very small niche, like something like a Sludge Viper, I only get eight. If it's a larger niche, like a Crimson Guard, uh, I think I've got 32 version one Crimson Guards. So who are some of the uh, kind of rare variants that you've been able to make a run on? Night Creeper Leader with flesh-toned accessories is interesting. That's a horrible bootleg. <laughs> that I mean, that I thing is. Up. You got to shoot that. I'm, I'm glad you called it because that thing is. It sets you aback how ugly it is. Yeah, it's a really bad bootleg, and sometimes stuff like that is so absurdly bad it's really hard to pass on. Yeah. Now, right behind it though is in sequence, left to right, a Venezuelan Ruby Plus Night Creeper. Mm -hmm. uh, to its right, with the missile launcher, is a European Night Creeper and then all the US Night Creepers next to those. You wanna show me a run on anybody? Uh, we can take a look at Destro. Oh yeah. Destro's always good. Um, you've got a US Destro, an Argentinian Destro, Brazilian Destro, and a Mexican Destro, uh, all side by side there. What are some of the differences there? Th those are pretty subtle. They are pretty subtle. The Argentinian Destro, you'll notice, has a dock waist to him, so that's an easy mm -hmm. identifier. Mm -hmm. Cheaper plastic overall. Mm -hmm. um, it's got the, a lower plunging vest as well. Yeah. He's, he's really letting it go. <laughs> Plastic qualities are a little bit different. The reds are a little bit different. Rivet colors, rivet construction, that kind of thing. Excellent. And I'd be remiss to not mention the uh, one of everybody's favorites hiding right behind them. Pimp Daddy. Which Pimp Daddy is Daddy the now, how always many, popular Pimp Daddy. How many Pimp Daddies made it out into the world? I would estimate just off the top of my head, and I haven't looked at numbers in years, I'd probably say there's 30 those maybe circulating running around. I never noticed until they were side by side how short and stocky he is. Yeah, so the 97 Destro mold is kind of tiny. Yeah. Now mind you, that's on a slightly shorter stand, mm -hmm. but it's a way smaller figure than a vintage Destro. Yeah, he's, st he's still buff, but he's just squat. Yep. Awesome. Little tiny head syndrome as well. Yeah. Very cool. What about Voltar to your left? Uh, Voltar, there's three Voltars there. There's a Brazilian Voltar right here. Mm -hmm. Next to that, I have a European Voltar mm -hmm. and then a US Voltar. So those are pretty close. It's not until you get those both in hand sometimes that you notice, but if you look at the yeah. little uh, the eyepiece that both of them are wearing. Yep. The monocle's darker on the left. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so some of these things, when you, when you see photos online, it's hard to tell it. But then you see it with the naked eye and you're like, yep, right away you get it. Well, there's a lot of times that I'm gambling. You know, I'll, right. I'll find out something from another country. I have no evidence beforehand that it's going to be any different. Yep. And, uh, or even that it's legit and I'm throwing cash in the wind. Yeah. And uh, it arrives and I'm happy because it's different. How many active collectors would you say are you kind of competing with? I'm, I'm sure there's guys that I don't know about that are trying to buy the same thing. Sure. What's the difference in these two Zartans up here? So one is the production release and then one is pre-production. And how do you go about, um, do you have to have internal contacts for that? Or <laughs> are you getting this like mid midnight shift from China or? No, yeah, some of it comes via eBay. Some of it comes via friends. Some of it comes, sure. you know, secondhand when another collector sells. Yep. So whatever the method. So right here you've got my Cobra Command um, and then kind of the support elements, the Televipers, the Techno Vipers and then kind of like a special missions, night operations group. So all my night vipers and then uh, Firefly and his cohorts down there. I think there was somebody that took the bases and like trimmed them short and actually combined them to make I like saw a that. giant tower out of it. It's pretty cool work. It was, it looked good. Did you say night viper was the first figure that you army built? 
or was that what set you on the path to army That's building? That's what set me on the path. I had inadvertently bought two laser vipers as a kid. I don't remember doing it intentionally. I'm, I'm the exact same way. I never army built a single figure growing up. I, I wonder why it is like as an adult, we finally discover that we can army build. The one in the middle is obviously fun school, right? Yeah, there's a whole line of fun school troops in there. Yeah. So when did you start collecting international? So I'd held off on international intentionally for several years. Now, part of that was because nobody was doing what we've been doing lately, which is comparison shots of those figures. Uh, Ron Connor and Derek Anderson had put out a good international guidebook, and I'd taken a look at it. Uh, but unfortunately, by putting the photos individually, I couldn't tell the difference. And then a good friend of mine, I want to say around 2006, offered me a deal I couldn't refuse on a bunch of his foreign figures. And uh, once I pulled the trigger, it was game over. These are my unproduced DTC Hiss tanks. What year would they have been released? So this was around 2000, I want to say 2005 off the top of my head. Despite both being unproduced, they are different from one another. So I'll turn these around and you can see that one has a closed back yep. completely. Yep. And then the other one has it open, which is kind of how, how it eventually ended up coming. They started with it closed and then they went to the open one? Right. And so you have two separate unproduced versions of that same vehicle. And obviously the final version had the color change as well. And how many of those unproduced vehicles would you say might have made it out? Obviously it's speculative. Probably would have been about six that would have been produced, five to six, yeah. for approvals. Um, how many actually ever made it out? I've only seen four surface. Mm -hmm. So you army build the drivers too, beyond maybe how many, say for instance maggots, you got a couple maggots, but you got maybe 12 worms, right? I do. So are, are they support staff? Do you have multiple worms per maggot? I do. Okay. So every vehicle I have, I try to have the vehicle fully staffed by the driver that came with it. So okay. every maggot holds three figures. Okay. So to me, it needs three worms. Okay. Of course, somebody watching this is going to say, but you have five maggots and 12 worms. That doesn't add up. <laughs> well, yes, that's because I added a Brazilian maggot recently. Green Frag Viper, is that a Letal? Yep. Where's he from? That's a Brazilian figure as well. Now, when you first started international collecting, did you limit yourself to one country over the other and then you kind of widened the net as you went or how did you approach it? Uh, I didn't approach any one country. What I started going first was the very distinctive figures, the ones that were obviously different from the US counterparts. Uh, so Brazil was one of the early focus countries. Um, not only were they different, painted but then they had different names different character backgrounds to a lot of them as well as some of the action force figures were at the top of my list so yeah up top you've got basically my uh, my cobra mountain troops mm -hmm. and cobra's answer to star brigade up there uh, below that then we get into several shelves of my polar forces and then my cobra navy takes up the whole rest of this section so this will be a running theme that you guys might notice He's a big Navy fan. Yeah, shock surprise. <laughs> cool, are there any uh, interesting variations, different kinds of, whoa, man. Hydro Viper looks oh, interesting. that's a bronze bomber. So the bronze bombers is a pretty interesting story, right? As an African-American run company. Yep. Uh, surfaced and then went away and then resurfaced. Licensed some Hasbro molds. Absolutely. I just thought it was interesting. I heard the lady's rationale was that she wanted to make more African-American heroes for peop for kids like her kids, you know what I mean? I'm all about it. That's the way I heard it told, and I thought that was a pretty, pretty great story. And I was surprised to see, you know, Hasbro, while they were still making these Joes, licensing their figures right. to another Molds. company. Yep. So do you have any strategy in here for preventing yellowing? I don't have any windows in here. I have a separate split AC unit that keeps the heat down. Uh, it's all LED lights that cuts down on UV exposure. It's really all you can do. I mean, so no smoke, no heat, no light. But unfortunately for me, when everything was moved out here, it all sat in a moving truck that drove through the desert in the middle of July. Yeah. Three days of uh, cooking in the back of a truck did its number. So for you folks out there that thought you were complete with a dark glove and light glove copperhead, we have news for you. Tell them what's different about it. So you've got the dark glove and the light glove, obviously. You've got the, you know, the difference in the greens, the neon green paint on both the head, the, you know, the armbands. Mm -hmm. And then if you look over and you look at the mail away, 
then you've got a different green on the armbands and the gloves. Yep. And traditionally, the groin piece is a different color, although it can discolor and end up just like the others. So yeah, again, from the naked eye, you can see that those gloves on the right are a little bit darker. The ones in the middle are more lime colored, a little, little more yellowish. And yeah. the ones on the right are definitely a darker hue. So this is the kind of stuff I, th I think until you see it and know to look for it, if you were just digging through a figure pile, you might not even notice it. And then I've got the U.S. eels, a couple Brazilian ones, some Argentinian ones, and then you're scanning right by my horde of red laser eel vipers there. Yeah, the removable helmet is, is awesome. Kudos to Red Laser for making a bootleg figure that offered something that the original didn't. Very cool figure. One of, it, it's a Viper that has a niche, right? It fits in with the eels seamlessly. Yeah, that color scheme is a perfect match. In this section is pretty simple. It's Cobra Infantry, and then uh, whether that's Vipers or Cobra Troops, and then we've got the Bats, and we've got my Cobra Urban Assault. So about how many troops can you fit going back? I mean, like how many Vipers is that? Uh, like if you're looking at the Viper pit right there, that's 200 Vipers. There you go. And you got your moderns. And a personal favorite for me, the Battle Android Trooper. Yeah. So what's the deal with these three up front? Uh, those are my, uh, my three Brazilian Roboids that I've picked up so far. And I noticed they have a uh, decal as opposed to a lenticular label. Is that a... Internationally, did anybody else get a lenticular label? Or was that just the U.S.? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's just the U.S. Yeah. I haven't picked up a fun school one yet, and honestly, I didn't pay a lot of close attention last time I looked at one of them. Mm -hmm. There's the infamous Cobra Hovercraft, another one of those battlefield robots designed by Guy back in the day. Yeah. I'm assuming that's fun school yellow again? That is fun school yellow. They had an affinity for yellow. And there's the... Other fun school vehicle. The What's European that? one left to the left of it. So are there any eras of G.I. Joe that you don't collect? Eras? Yeah. No. Are there certain years where you're just like, mm, I'm out? Nope. To me, the, the entire run, everything has its place that it fits. That is proof positive by all the Neo Vipers. <laughs> You got a run here you'd like to show? Yeah. So some people like to buy unproduced figures. Right. Some people like to troop build. <laughs> as far as I know, I'm one of the only people that does both. So here are eight, sticking to my classic number, of the unproduced Alley Viper from the Walmart set that was supposed to come out uh, circa 2003-2004. So that's a Snake Eyes motorcycle from the Valor vs. Venom era, uh -huh. but the colors to me lined up with the Coil Trooper, who uh, by okay. file card okay. was a high speed like motorcycle pilot or rider. Awesome. So I bought a bunch of Snake Eyes, got rid of all the figures, kept the bikes, and gave them to the Coil Trooper. Very cool. And then right next to the left of him is the uh, another unproduced set, uh, the Alley Viper, Firefly, Storm Shadows, etc. Were the mm -hmm. uh, an altered deco to the uh, urban six pack. So if you want anything else, there's the unproduced Vipers. Also same era around 2004. Matt Black. So how many different uh, searches do you have saved on eBay? Uh, I probably get about 50 emails a day from eBay. Now we're getting to the aerial support. Yep. So at the top you have Python Patrol uh -huh. all the way across and then everything below that is air. Uh, so I have all my trouble bubbles and gliders at the top, and then we get down to rotary, um, ground support, and then finally fighters and other purpose. And what are those uh, flight stands that you use to try to get the second row of... So those are made by a company called Flight Pose. Mm -hmm. They make, uh, if I remember correctly, four, six, and eight inch stands. Yep. Is that the convention figure that came with the vehicle? Uh, yeah. You already got eight of those? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this is incredible. I'm a huge fan of the Hurricane. And one of the first <laughs> things I noticed when I came in here was that darker blue Hurricane. It's more of a uh, royal blue. So this is a European Hurricane. So it has a, definitely a different color to it. Much different blue, different grays. 
especially back here on the engines, much darker, mm -hmm. and then a uh, much more transparent canopy. And what about the figure that came with it? Was that pretty similar? Yeah, the the vapor is almost identical. Okay. Any good runs on figures in here? Everybody loves Fun School Wild Weasel. He's just a clown. Obviously, you have a ton of value sitting in this room. What do you do about insuring it? I know a lot of collectors are worried about that. Honestly, I think if you're a collector and you have, say, more than 10,000 invested in your collection, uh, you're foolish not to insure your collection. And is that a typical homeowner's policy or is it a, a different type of policy? What do you need? No, you can get specific uh, collector's insurance. Uh, the one I have, they only ask for proof of items over a set value. Um, and then just to protect myself, I take frequent photos or videos, or you have this, yep. uh, document everything so they can't ever say. The real trick with that, though, becomes um, ascertaining value. Yep. You know, it would be very hard. Uh, some things, especially when you're dealing with collectibles, prices ebb and flow. If you paid at the height of something, you know, you look at a lot of 25th figures yeah. and then uh, how much the market crashed on those, you could still end up losing money if you had to replace. But the way my, my insurance works is you estimate the value of your collection mm -hmm. and you pay your premium based on that estimate. We're making quite a, ju <laughs> we're making quite a jump here, you know what I mean? We can, we can show off the non-Joe stuff. Uh, a little bit of dabble in some Transformers. A little bit. I'm a Transformers fan. I'm not a huge Transformers collector, so... You know, some good G1 representations is about all I really worry about. You know all the names to all of them? Uh, yeah. Okay. I do. This is my little crossover shelf Uh huh. for everything that's usually come out of, like, San Diego Comic-Con. Got the brand new set. Um, got the brand new set thrown in there. So anything that meshes, meshed G.I. Joe or Transformers, and now yep. they threw those other couple lines in there. So Very cool. I really couldn't find a place for it to fit with the Joe collection itself, so I figured it'd get its own shelf. Cool. What's down here? Oh, you got some Star Wars. A little bit of Star Wars. And we're going to go right past that shelf. <laughs> 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 All right, so you got a ton of kind of peripheral merchandise. Uh, way up top, you got some eclectic visionaries. I'm a huge visionaries geek. Love the toys. Those stands were all made by a buddy of mine, Jason, a little while ago. He 3D printed those, so they hold the staffs. Can't get enough of that toy line. I'm hoping it goes somewhere. And then, yeah, everybody loves Transformers, but got to give the GoBots some love. I remember the GoBots. So, I don't have many. I just recently started picking those up. Yep. That'll go crazy soon enough. All right. And then you got, obviously, all the club stuff. Yep. Got some peripheral DVDs, books. DVDs, books. Command rings. Whatever. VHS, command rings. Atari game. Yeah. Custom art. Board games and more reference books. So this was impressive to me. Like you literally collect everything, Joe. Of course, you got the very early in package micro figures. Those are great. Good size lunchbox collection. Um, I thought mine was complete until Sam pointed out that I'm missing the red Tiger Force one. Yep. I'm one shy myself. I got to get the Crusader that. lunchbox. Yeah. And then you got all the collector cases up top, which are cool. And you've got assembled puzzles hanging on the walls. Now this is near and dear to my heart. For anybody that loves Lego and G.I. Joe, I don't know how you can go without having both. Creo is a great line. You may notice a couple figures in here that were not released. There's a uh, hooded Cobra Commander and a Dusty and a uh, Stinger, Stinger driver. driver Officer. So that hooded Cobra Commander, I'm going to be losing sleep over that one as well as uh, Dusty up here. So if you're not a huge fan of a, a certain iteration of the line, we still just collect it to support the brand. Even if you don't necessarily love the direction that it's headed, do you just feel like a sense of loyalty to the brand where I'm just gonna go ahead and get it anyway? Or I don't feel like I have an obligation uh -huh. to buy anything. Right, You Good. know, I, I'm, At the end of the day, I'm a consumer Hasbro makes product. Um, if I don't want it on some level, I'm not going to buy it. Um, it's funny you ask that as we get to Sigma 6. A lot of people didn't like it when it came out. Um, I like it. I thought it was a great toy line. Yeah. Uh, if you get over the fact that it's not 
three and three quarter Joe, I think the toys themselves have huge play value, held up really well, yep. and that that larger scale allowed them to do some really cool things. Some of which eventually got tailored back into the main line. And I feel like these are toys that kids could actually play with, have fun with, beat up, pose. They would hold their pose. They would hold their weapons. Yeah. Some things that are missing from the modern era, you know, 25th and up. Yeah, they're, they're definitely a durable toy. And I don't mind the character design at all. I know it's going in that Japanese animation anime direction, but it, do, it doesn't bother me. But, I mean, obviously there was some competing ideas at play at the time. And uh, this one just didn't win out. So they did these concurrently, like in parallel, they did two different scales. Correct. You had eight and a half, two and a half inch. The two and a half inch line ended up clearancing out pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, it didn't get very far. Some of the uh, some of the vehicles only showed up at select outlets. Which is a real shame because like this Dragonfly helicopter is built to hold a couple pilots up front and a, a bike underneath and it's got a couple of really cool play features and it's just a beautiful vehicle and uh, we were talking earlier about it purposely you know being built so that you could swap the seats and maybe include the larger figures but they right. cut that. That was a play feature cut at the last minute. That's a shame because I could see that in my collection for three and three quarter. So that's about the uh, end of the kind of stuff you could buy at retail. I mean, basically this whole, this whole collection right here is statues and figures. You've got a mix of sideshow collectibles, Gentle Giant, Palisades. Yeah, there's prototypes in there. Yeah, so right there you've got the uh, planned Hasbro titanium line. So do you know how many of those titaniums were made? I think these are the only copies, period. Holy shit, really? Yeah, there's one of each. Yeah. And that's them. For whatever reason, that got canceled and that's pretty much all there is of it. It's, it's hard to appreciate the level of detail that these sculpts allowed for um, on video. It's just not gonna translate. Like the, the rotors on the front of the Rattler, there's just an insane level of detail in there. Honestly, it's a shame. We've shown some pictures of that online before and uh, I have to agree with one of the one of the major drawbacks is the lack of a scale consistency. Right. But I think that's about the only thing that I don't like about it. I would have snapped them up. Yeah, absolutely. I would have been buying these. I agree. Like like the micro vehicles that we got back in the early '90s, those weren't um, scaled equivalent to each other. But I, you can look past that for the level of detail and quality that these sculpts were. I mean, it's amazing. Like you were saying earlier how well something as small as the Fang translated down to that scale. Yeah. And still with working uh, rotors and like deployable bombs, I don't know if you can see on the Sky Striker back there, that bomb would have dropped out of the Sky Striker. So it's ridiculous. At that scale, that's just freaking awesome. So this is one of my favorite things in the room that I've seen today. Uh, below that, you've got some straight up test shots. So a test shot is usually you're just running plastic through the mold make yep. sure that it works. They came out in a variety of colors. I kind of like the single color ones. And then the vehicle there is a actual uh, alternate version of the Road Rebel. So mm -hmm. if anybody looks online, sees the Road Rebel, it had a single looking cannon missile launcher. Uh, it was planned then to get changed to the dual launcher mm -hmm. and then that got canceled. All right, cool. So now we're down to the uh, Palisades or this is, a, yeah, this Palisades, right? Uh, diamond slash Palisades, yeah. The mm -hmm. bust on the right is. Oh, diamond on the right, Palisades on the left. Yeah, and then I Palisades, had... the shelf below. Yeah. And so Palisades, do you know how many years they had the license for? Uh, off the top of my head, I'd guess about three. Okay. They were pretty productive. They did a bunch of these mini busts. Yeah, a lot around 2003, 2004. Stuff looks awesome. So you got some six or seven inch, you know, full figured uh, statues, and then you've got these three or four inch mini busts. And uh, I'll show you guys the Cobra side here in a second. And below that, you have the even shorter lived. Oh, gentle giant. Well, wonder, wonderfully intended gentle giants. They're just 12 inch reproductions of the exact 1982 straight arm figures. Only came out with four of them. They had uh, planned Zap and they had showed Zap, but Zap never made it. These are uh, still, they're accessible. I mean, you can get them. They're a hundred bucks to maybe two hundred bucks tops. You might play. You might pay two hundred bucks for Firefly. Definitely the exclusive or whatever. But yeah, some of those are hot. For the most part, you know, with the exception of like a Red Ninja, 
you can you can pick up these sideshow figures for 100 bucks, 150 bucks, and I'd say go go for it. I've gone all in. Nomad has gone all in. You won't regret it. It's incredible stuff. There's my boy. I appreciate you putting Falcon up front. <laughs> <laughs> That's where officers lead from. That's right. So Sideshow, in addition to creating awesome 12 inch figures, they created a bunch of play sets. And to me, these things look like they might be too small or not have enough pieces and parts for me to you know, warrant, how much were they, like 150, 200, something? Uh, a little more than that, I think, even. They weren't super affordable. And to me, they looked like there was only a few pieces to them, so I didn't know if it would be enough. But now that I've seen the characters in these environment in person, I think the pendulum's swinging the other way for me. They look really good in these shelves, too. So the Baroness is a uh, premium format figure, which is a little different, still made by Sideshow. It's still, a statue with clothes on it. It's got some real fabric on it. More Sideshow. It's a great statue and very affordable. Pick it up for maybe a little over 100 bucks, 150. And of course, the Snake Eyes versus Red Ninjas. Oh, that's awesome. So a pretty damn comprehensive Sideshow collection. Is there anything you didn't pick up from them? I'm still missing the uh, Arashikage Temple and the, uh, the Desert Outpost. So I wouldn't say it's something I didn't pick up, just something I haven't gotten yet. If you're gonna start with Sideshow, just go ahead and go in hard and pick up Firefly. Yeah, you can't. it's one of those figures you can't go wrong with. Got the Cobra Officer, Cobra Trooper, and in the back the Cobra Sniper. So there's three of those. They also did Desert Editions of the Sniper and the Officer. Oddly, not the Trooper. Of course, you got all the ninjas. Never have too many ninjas when it comes to G.I. Joe, apparently. How do you feel about that Crimson Cobra Commander? No, no real reason for it, right? No, there's no good reason for it. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of people that felt it should be Crimson since we had the Crimson Guard. I could take it or leave it. All right, so what are we looking at here, man? Uh, back to a whole bunch of test shots. Okay. This is the Cobra side. Happen to have a few more of those. And what years were these? Uh, most of this is the uh, about 2003 to 2005 era. Yeah. Man, you just got rose that stuff. There's the uh, the plague set. I'm a huge fan. So. So we were talking about these earlier. Palisades did these mini busts. You saw the Joe ones on the other side. But these were just some of the best sculpts. Absolutely beautiful sculpting work on these. And he's got most of them here. Of course, there's the Optimus Storm Shadow. Who did that? I want to say that was Diamond. It was released in the UK in small quantities and released in the US in small quantities and you're better off looking at eBay UK. One of my favorite Cobra Commander statues. Actually, I think I'll say it. That's my favorite Cobra Commander statue right there. Absolutely. This is perfect. What's the deal with all your uh, Keel Hall army building? <laughs> no, no true building. You know, it's uh, so the vintage, you know, the original Keel Hall, patch or no patch. Yep. The uh, Battle Corps Keel Hall. Large insignia on the back of the jacket versus small insignia, and then there's the Brazilian keel hall, and then, as always, bootlegs that are just too good to pass up on. Those bootlegs are pasty white. They huh? are horrible. <laughs> they're, they're definitely pasty white. They look... Uh, the plastic is bad. The paint is bad. They don't shades. stand up right. Uh, the accessories are about as brittle as it gets. Yeah. Who could pass? I noticed you got some... Uh, you some, got some weapon transports. Yeah. yeah which are, again, all different for anybody that thought I was troop building. So there's uh, three U.S. versions, including two separate mail aways, yep. and then a fun school and Argentina. All right, so now we've entered probably the most intense part of your collection. <laughs> intense. <laughs> a big wetsuit torpedo fan. In addition to whatever I buy to go in the collection, then I also get both a separate one to keep packaged and a figure to directly rip from the package yeah. that goes in the case. So all the loose figures are opened by me, mm -hmm. put right in here. And then uh, like in this shelf here, there's a wetsuit and torpedo test shots. Are right in the middle, yeah. Uh, right in the middle. And then the uh, there's an unproduced version of the torpedo, the 50th torpedo up front. Oh man, he's awesome too. So what's up with these uh, Sigma 6s? Well, 
the one on the left, the orange one, is the regular Sigma-6 wetsuit. And then the one in the yellow, black, and gray is the unproduced uh, adventure team version of wetsuit, complete with the cage shark and treasure chest. Took me a long time to track it down and uh, didn't go for cheap. I gotta say, the uh, the animal sidekicks, the alligator and tiger. Oh, they're and, awesome. They're great, man. I mean, you got articulated tails there. There's like at least two or three joints in the tail. Oh, yeah. The jaw opens and closes. Yeah, of course. Those are fun, man. I could just see that being a fun toy for a kid to play with. Yeah. There's a normal Sigma-6 torpedo. Yep. Retail release. Yep. Of course, you got the Creo pedos. Got to have, uh, got to have Creo, and, and then uh, built uh, to rule. Built to rule. Twenty fifth. So some of this is just standard retail release. Nothing really yep. fancy. Got the, uh, the cards from the uh, collectible trading card game, thrown in there. Mm -hmm. um, some more test shots, for torpedo. How hard are the test shots to get? Do those typically pop up on eBay or? Do you have to know somebody? Uh, pop up on eBay or through friends. Yep. Some of them go for cheap. It's not too bad. Yep. Some of them I just keep buying. I have uh, three pretty identical torpedo test shots. So your army building test shots. Eh, it pops up and <laughs> every time I see one, I pull the trigger on it. Yeah. So these are the three matching test shots? Yeah. Who doesn't need that? Who doesn't army build test shots anyway? Just great colors, man. It was a good era. So here's some more prototype. Uh, resin sculpt for the Joe vs. Cobra 2 pack. Mm -hmm. So when you say resin sculpt, what, what part of the process is that? Because they, they would build them originally at the two-up scale. Were they still doing two-ups by this point? No. Oh, two okay. Ups were, two ups were a thing in the 80s and 90s. Okay. So by this point, they were doing almost a one-to-one -one sculpt. Wow. Um, just slightly larger. I always thought they did the two ups because they felt they could get more detail into it. They just decided to, it was a needless step. Yeah. So again, retail releases, some foreign carded releases, and even 12 inch. That's great. You won't see a lot of 12 inch in here, but it's got torpedo or wetsuit. You're going to see it. It's here. What is he riding there? It's like a, uh, it's kind of like the manta. It's like the manta. So this is one of the things that kind of scratches my itch. This weird peripheral stuff like swim fins for torpedo and wetsuit. Got to have the watch. Got a quartz watch, which I assume is waterproof to two miles. <laughs> got your torpedo swim fins. Not about to test it out. Nah. And you got to have the, uh, the snorkel. So how you go about finding this stuff? You're just scouring oh, eBay? Oh man, this is, this is where having uh, a focus collection comes in handy and having friends. Yep. Um, sometimes I'll have friends that just spot this stuff on eBay and they send me a link. So That's the best part of the community, man. When people get to know you, they realize what you're passionate about and they start trying to help you achieve whatever you're trying to achieve. I've definitely had that experience. Yeah, and you don't think of kind of the early 90s as the more highly merchandised years. Obviously the early 80s, mid 80s were the, the right. zenith of licensed merchandise. So for you to find all this Kind of early 90s stuff is really... And just pertaining to one character. Right. All right, man. So this is kind of the... To me, this is the climax. <laughs> because I don't have the opportunity to be around two-ups very often. These are a very rare and valuable part of the creative process. 80s and 90s, Joes were originally done up at a two-to-one scale, a.k.a. a two-up um, for its size. So about eight inches, not quite. That was the original size and then shrunk down via pantograph. That allowed us to get down to like the resin that's in front there. Mm -hmm. That would be what the mold was made off of. And then, uh, you know, you lost a little bit of it in shrinkage there when it was done down to production size. So generally those were used as reference then, like that is a, referred to as a paint master. So that is the, uh, the guide then for coloration for the figure. So those are retail figures, but I ripped them off a card. Mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody will be aghast at such an idea. <laughs> no, I did uh, basically all of 90 to 94 that way. Yeah. So here you get into uh, some foreign versions as well as then the bags are uh, vendor production samples. Yeah. So vendor production samples would be sent back to Hasbro from the factories, sort of, hey, here's your toy, make sure this is what, this is how you wanted it. 
Last call before we're gonna mass produce these things. So sometimes when you find uh, vendor production samples, and I have a few in the collection that are different from the final version, mm -hmm. but often they are identical right. to what was finally produced. Um, that yellow wetsuit down there is a mail away from Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a nice little sword with him for no known reason. <laughs> the other figure there is actually a, technically a prototype for the guile uh, from the Street Fighter line, mm -hmm. but it's still done in the wetsuit, Deco. using the wetsuit figure uh, to make the prototype in a vendor production sample bag. Wow. Got some Herb Tramp art back here. Yep, that is from, uh, that's the original art to the wetsuit order battle entry. Nice. No, I did not rip open a Mission Brazil set just <laughs> to rip open the... <laughs> The wetsuit, but I did manage to get a, a damaged bubble Brazil wetsuit still in the bubble. And yeah, I ripped that puppy open and there he is. And then the one next to that is a European overstock still in the bag. Yeah, that is the original sculpt done by... Um, Merkline? Bill Merkline. So he had that photo that got passed to me. Awesome. Of course, you got some international wetsuits at the U.S. release. Yeah, one Maybe. version of the U.S. release, unpunched. And then that there is a kind of like a photo guide. So they would shoot a photo of the card arc, and that would be used for all licensing purposes. That's gorgeous, man. And then there we go. <laughs> At this point, that kind of speaks for itself. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing, man. Irreplaceable one-of-a-kind item right there. So these are all Fun School Torpedo. Just came out with three different color variations? Yep. Cool. Awesome. So again, with the ones that I opened, I tried to find uh, some damaged card backs. Yeah. And uh, those are the ones that got torn open. They needed to be freed, man. Yep. <laughs> There you have Action Force releases, as well as a uh, European overstock bag torpedo. Still looking for a U.S. one on uh, on the bubble. Mm -hmm. Mail away bubble. Anybody finds one? There's your plug. Help this man complete his collection. There you go. It'll certainly be in a good home. Awesome. All right, and of course you got the big granddaddy of them all, the flag and the defiant. That is. Uh, while not mine in childhood, that is the one I played with. Uh, that used to belong to my best friend. And when I got into collecting, I called him up, asked him if I could buy it off of him, and he, uh, his answer was just go over to mom's house and pick it up. Wow. So both the flag and defiant are, uh, are the ones I grew up with. Is that choking you up? No. <laughs> I'm just talking so much. Yeah. <laughs>